What's up, everybody? This your boy, Bill Bellamy. Welcome to Top Billing. This is the hottest podcast in the country. This is the place you come to for the movement, the culture, and the discussion. Today's special guest is none other than Harlem's own. I don't know how I can put this into words, all the things that this man embodies. Rap music, the culture, photography, one of the hottest DJs to really, really take us out of the quarantine, slow down. Ladies and gentlemen, can we make some real strong noise for D Nice in the building? We got you here. We finally made yes. it happen. Yes. We finally made it happen. Bro, I've known you over 20 years. It took me 20 years to get you here. Over 30, <laughs> over 30, over 30. Over, over, over 30 years. Over 30 years, man. Yeah. Um, it took you a long time to get me. Yeah, but, but it wasn't that I didn't thing, want to do it though. Yes, because I've been I've been working. You this know? is one of the stories that I've uh, wanted to tell since I got my podcast, and we had a discussion. This was probably maybe six months ago, five months ago. We're both in New York City, and uh, we just happened to. Bump heads right here at the bar. We're sitting there about to go to the Knicks game. Yes. And we start just vibing. You know, we can't connect again. I end up going to a show with you where you, you you performed that night. Just, you know, you did a quick set at the Knicks game. Yes. And I'm like, yo, it's like that. And you like, you say, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Explain it's crazy. to us how, like, the quarantine really changed your life. Well, one, I, I do want to remind people, I, I was born in Harlem, but raised in the Bronx, so I kind of claim both so places. You, yeah, you got a little BX. Yeah, no, shout out to the BX. I got a shout out to the BX. I can never forget the BX. Um, but no, quarantine definitely changed my life, and, and not necessarily in terms of, like, um, being a DJ or in-demand DJ. I was al already an in-demand DJ for the last 15 years, but my gigs were mainly private events. Right. So I was doing you know, Super Bowl events. I was doing the inaugural ball, you know, balls for like the Obamas and you know, Barack's parties and, you know, fashion shows and fashion week. And I was doing all of that. But what the quarantine did for me in terms of like visibility was the people that weren't invited to events like that. They were they were finally able to experience the way that I listen to music and the way that I love music. So it kind of gave me a much more broad like audience in terms of Absolutely. like, of like, yeah, like. You know, I don't have to just play one specific thing. You can, can do everything. I can do everything. And, like, it gave me that audience. And it was the music that, that people needed during that time of healing. Absolutely. You know, um, um, you know like I, I, I was telling you before, like, you know, it wasn't that I, I didn't love, like, trap music and EDM because that, that's mainly what my gigs were whenever I would do a club or, you know, whether it was Vegas or Atlantic City or live in Miami I had to, I had to be able to play that type of music, and I actually love that type of music. Mm -hmm. But during the quarantine, that didn't resonate with people like doing it virtually. Yeah, you know, like you can't just listen to like just up tempo beats all all day. You need to, the music needs to say something to you. You need it to speak to your heart. The words, mm -hmm. the the vibe, the music of it. I I think you found uh, the language to talk to the people inadvertently. I think because when I watched and experienced Club Quarantine as a fan of music, as a fan of yours, and as a friend, I thought that the connection was that you united us all in one room and we all liked it. Like we, it was, it was like the room was the perfect temperature. 72. Yes. <laughs> 72. That's 72 great. degrees. The music wasn't too loud. Right. You it could, was in the pocket. You could still talk to each other, but you heard some good tunes. And, and I was like, where is he? Is he like, I always wanted to, like, this is the funny part. When I was watching, I was like, is he, like, in the hallway, kind of against the corner? Is he by the kitchen? Like, I was always trying to figure out, like, what part of the house you was in. Because you was grooving for hours. Didn't for hours. get tired yeah. at all. I mean, I I was doing it from my living room. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, I, I had a loft space in uh, downtown L.A. Mm -hmm. So the space was literally on the counter between the kitchen and the living room. Exactly. Like, you it know? felt so intimate. Yes. It felt so personal um, to witness. And it just felt organic. It felt and, organic. And for, for, for all the listeners that are uh, listening to Top Billing, and you went through uh, the quarantine, wherever you live, wherever you're from in the world, if you had this situation, you needed an outlet. And I I got wind, I followed you anyway, but when it popped up and I was like, what is he doing? I was like, what What was the thing that made you say, I'm just going to spin today? Like, how did that happen? Um, it wasn't about DJing. When I, when I first, when I initially started, it was like, hey, I was sitting at home alone. I woke up that morning. I was like, you know what? They have this IG Live feature. I never used IG Live. You know, I'd gone live on Facebook. Right. I'd use Facebook Live. And I was like, hey, I'm just going to try to do this. And I knew, you know, 
you weren't really supposed to play music. You you know, you end up getting flagged. And, and I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go online and I'm going to tell some stories about not just records that I had produced back in the day, but the records that meant something to me growing up in New York City. You know, I would tell a story, and initially it was called homeschool. Right. That's what I started calling it. I was like, oh, this is homeschool. Okay. And um, and I would tell stories about, I would be like, oh, I remember when I was like 17, and I walked into this club called The Rooftop in, in Harlem, and Bruce Lee B was DJing, and he would play this record, and everybody in there from Harlem, Uptown, felt like, oh, this is my jam. Right. And I would, <laughs> then I would play Dennis Edward, Don't Look Any Further. <sighs> Dennis Edwards, you know, like I would play Don't Look Any Further. And it was like, oh, and then I would see the comments like, oh, this used to be my song. Because then people weren't really playing as much old school as they do now. Yeah. Oh, so you brought, I, I want to give you your flowers. Like, I feel like you took us back to the essence of how we used to listen to music. Yes. I mean, now when I hear like my son, you know, my son's 16, and I say, let's say Cat's under 30, right? Their vibe for old school, I want to say it's probably 10% of their repertoire, maybe 15%, where my age group and down, say from 50 to 30, we have this we have this wide band of music yes. from 80s, 70s, 90s, 2000s. Like we we watched, I feel like my my age group, we literally are in the birthplace of hip hop. Yes. Like literally, yeah. like it it, it Hip hop got started a, a few summers or something before I, you know. Yeah, got and and we grew up with hip hop like yeah, we really yeah. did, and yes. it was um the thing about it was like I kind of owe it to to like a lot of us DJs being unwilling to play those old school records for like the younger generation. Right. I don't want to just blame it on them because like now that they heard them, they like, like them. I, yeah, they're, they're like, oh yo, you just. I didn't know that this Biggie sample came from that. Oh, I didn't know Drake sampled, you know, Hamilton and whatever for, you know, <laughs> the best I ever had. I didn't even know that was a sample. Like, and then exactly. I was exactly. And now they love, they got an affinity for this type of music. And it was because we introduced them, we introduced the music to them when the world stopped. And then they looked around. Like one day DJ Envy of the Breakfast Club called me. This was like the first week of the quarantine. Mm -hmm. And he said, Bro, this is the first time that I could dance with my family. You know, like, I never ah, forgot that. Ah, that's hot. Just as a DJ, like, we tend to not play music when we're home. You know, we're working all the time. You come, you know, that's the last thing you, you're going to do. Like, I didn't even have turntables at home, which is also why I wasn't DJing in the beginning. Because right. I didn't have turntables. I didn't believe in that. I was like, once I'm home, I'm home. I'm off but, the like, clock. now we, we've introduced young, this, you know, younger generations, not just one. You know, there are people in their 30s that have never heard Sister Sledge thinking of you. Until I kept playing it over and over, and they're like, "Yeah, yo, this feels good." Yo, you know, those and, um, lot, and, and the thing that um a lot of cats now don't know if you're not of a certain age, back in the day they actually played all those instruments. Yes, like every song that you hear that's an old school song, there was real musicians playing. There was no machines back then. There was nothing to help your voice. You had to sound like that record for real. True. And, and and they and they they had nobody knows what a dad is now. Like nobody knows what a cassette tape is. Like I said to my son, you ever heard of a remix? He was like, what? Like they don't even know like how we would take a sample from an old song, do it one way, and then remix it again, and then throw like four or five people. They don't even True. do that no more in music. True. No, they don't. <laughs> it's I mean, but but it's it's probably that way because we didn't have the resources that they have now. Because right. if we had these resources, then we would have made music the same way. You know, um, but I, I do respect the process, you know, like and I respect um, I respect the way people make music now. You know, like back then you had to like take your two inch reel, record it. And then you had to overnight your two inch reel yep. to the West Coast and then wait for them to do it. Like now they send out stems and we can get a song done quickly. And I don't knock that. I'm like, wait, I actually love it. You know, that's does part it, of does the music. OK, because I'm a I'm a old school like music lover used to go to to the Tower Records and Virgin Records yes. music store and buy a real CD in a in an album, right? Do you think the texture cuz I saw um DJ Quick say something that was so profound. He said um what he liked about the tape as opposed to digital is the tape captured the vibration and the energy was recorded on that piece of tape. Yes. So whatever the feeling was, whatever the 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 energy you brought while you were singing or rapping, 
that was captured in that frequency on that piece of tape. I, I agree. was like, damn, 100%. that's crazy. He said, so that's why the sound is different. Yes. So now when you do digital, even though it's cleaner, how does digital not allow for that feeling that DJ uh, Quinn was I mean, talking about? Yeah, I mean, I mean, tape, bro, like tape. Mm-hmm. One, having something tangible, like, yeah, that frequency is going to be extremely different. And it's not going to be as warm as it as it was if you record digital versus putting it on a two inch reel, which is why some people still like like true audio files, like still listen to vinyl. You know, yeah. like they still like they'll go out and buy vinyl. Like I, I have vinyl. Look, I mean, the other day I got, uh, you know, I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear this new Beyonce album in, on a, on a turntable. You know, see what it sounds like. Yeah, like right. you know, and um, even though she recorded it digitally, but there are people who like Lenny Kravitz, for instance. Okay. Lenny still records on on like on on uh, two inch reels. You know, like the old Lenny, school, the old school way. Like that's that's a vibe, though. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you said, that's you, a vibe. You know, it's a it's a true vibe. You know, if you if you are if you love music that way, like I think that part is important. But if you didn't grow up like that. And you are used to making music the way that it's being made now. Right. You don't really know the difference. You don't know the sound. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize there was such a unique difference until I just happened to catch uh, DJ Quick talking about it like that, and it made me really appreciate um, being able to to hear music that was recorded that way before. Sure, sure. Like sure. if you hear like a old school, let's go, uh, let's go back, Bobby Womack, or let's go, oh, uh, yeah. uh, Evelyn Champagne King, you of know. Or, you know, like uh, Ring My Bell, Anita Ward, right? Like, we go back in those days. Those kind of songs now, when you play them and you mix them even with some new stuff, it's it's bananas. No, it is. Um, yeah, even like me just being a DJ and playing a lot of the older records, yeah, they, it doesn't feel good. Uh, a lot of it also comes from people not really being true audio engineers as well. Okay. You know, you do have people that are mixing records for like, you know, today's artists that are winning Grammys and that are super dope. What, you know, even young guru, he came up, he went to school for this. A lot of the kids didn't have, um, and I'm only saying this because I remember what it was like when we were coming up. Absolutely. When, when we didn't have budget for, for, you know, studio time or proper studio time. I mean, when you think about our very first record, South Bronx was recorded, you know, at, at, in someone's home on a 16 track. Or if you think about like EPMD, like their first album, um, Strictly Business, that whole album was recorded on one 24 inch reel. What? One two inch reel. I'm sorry, two inch reel, but like where well, you only had 24 tracks and you had like 12 minutes on a two inch reel and they literally figured out how to like <laughs> use eight of the tracks to do one song and another eight to do another and four tracks to do like they had an entire Whoa. album. Because it was all based on we didn't have music for like musicians, we, you know, you had to make an album with ten grand, yeah. you know, so that was all. So you had to be resourceful. Yeah, and, and it was all based on, you know, just using samples, and that's what we had, you know. Like now, a lot of the kids, you know, and I actually I don't want to call them kids, very disrespectful. A lot of the music, you know, the recording artists and producers, and you know, they have they have unlimited tracks now. Unlimited. You know, they have access to. You know, you know, uh, um, auto tune. Or, I, I'm or, gonna take you back. So, um, when I was doing Def Comedy Jam, you know, uh, shout out to my boy Kid Capri. Kid Capri had a crate. I call him the crate man. So this is back in the day. Uh, you know, you did. Is this is early '90s? Kid Capri would come and he would have at least 20 crates of records that were albums. It was all alphabetical order or some kind of genre. He had it organized a certain way. So when he was doing the spinning, and they were all in milk crates, and he would just go boom, bam, boom. And I'd be like, yo, back in the day, he was traveling, carrying all this music, cut to, bam, now you got a computer, you don't need all that. You don't have your, your man computer. back. Computer, you don't even need that. Which, which we do. I mean, you can have your songs on the thumb drive. <laughs> yeah, you just... That's how most EDM DJs, that's actually how all EDM DJs play. They, they, they come in with, like, music in their pockets and just drop them. You know, right now it's it's about how you how do you get the music to the people. Yeah, and I, I think you have not only figured that out, you have expanded your brand. Um, most people don't even know how of amazing photographer you are. You know, um, for the last 10, 12 years that I've, I've, bumped into you and you've even shot me before as well is that you you have photographed everyone in the business you've 
you've done some of the most incredible work. Like I've seen your work and, and it, it literally, you could put it in a museum yes. and you could do like a real fly sort of tribute to D nice, just your photography. Do you still have that love and have time to get to your photography as well? Yes. No, I still have the love to shoot. I just don't have the time to shoot as much as I used to, you know, like, um, you know, my love of photography is, is, is second to my love to me of music. You know, mm -hmm. like, if I wasn't DJing right now, I would, I would be in the studio taking pictures. You know, I collect Leica cameras. Um, I have a nice collection. And I really do love taking pictures. And it, it, it was really about um, when my rap career was over, I had nothing tangible to show, like, my future kids at the time. I was right. like, man, I toured the world, toured with Cube, Too Short, you know, everyone came to, you know, with KRS. And I, I made the mistake of taking pictures and not, saving the negative, you know, <sighs> because I didn't understand the importance of the negatives, you know, like I was a young kid, you yeah. know, I was touring since I was like 17. And, you know, I thought like the, the, the value was like, Oh, I, got, I went to CVS or whatever and got this, I got my prints. I, I don't, I don't even recall what I did with the negatives. Then when, when my career was over as a, as a rap artist, I was trying to figure out like, yo, where are all of these pictures that I, I shot? And you went everywhere. And, and I had nothing. So, you know, I, I made a pact to, with myself, like, you know, in the early, I'd say like the late 90s, like wherever I go, I'm going to have a camera and, and capture and, it. Yes. And you, I mean, and you can capture it with uh, with, you know, with your pocket devices, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, but it doesn't feel the same to me as a photo, as a as a camera, though, right. you know, like using a camera and 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 focusing that to me, you know, I, I wanted to be known as someone who shot with 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 uh um just a, a a particular type of camera you know and that goes back to like being photographed by gordon parks oh. and seeing like this man at, at the you know i think when he when he transitioned um he was probably in his 90s so this was probably like 15 to between 15 and 20 years before he passed he photographed all of his rappers it was like a great day in harlem right where he um recreated the jazz the jazz uh photograph but he did it with all hip hop guys. Oh. And like to see like this man in his seventies still have a love for his craft. I was like, man, when I get older, I want to be. You can that still way. do it. That you know, do what you love, and you get better at it. Like I think um, the beauty of being an artist is there's no cap on it, right? Sure. And I think where you your artistry lies with, from what I'm feeling, is how you feel about something. Like you love the music, so you present it a certain way. You love photography, so you you have a sensibility about um, the energy of it, and that's why I think you've become so successful. Is that you've tapped into who you are, you've tapped into what your people or what you want your people to see, whether it's through your photography or you what you want them to feel through your music. Yes, you know. Hold on one sec while we. I mean, we can keep this going, but you already know what I look like with the hat on. I want the headphones on now, so I'm going to take this off. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I thought you was about to DJ something. I mean, you, you know, hey, if you have turntables, I'll get wait, into wait, it. He was about to get live. I'm like, what? Uh -oh. I'm like, if he up. take the hat off, it just got real. Yeah, no, no. Um, You know what it was, though? It's like when, when my rap career, you no, know, I'm telling you, that's why I said, like, some people say, like, oh, you know, you're very lucky. And I'm like, no, I just... I just followed the universe and wherever it led me to, you know, when people thought that I was old school back in my rap days, I was like, man, I'm 23. How am I old school? How am I old school? <laughs> I'm you know, and like no one wanted to give me a record deal. Right. Like it was, it was a struggle, you know? Right. And then I just took the time where I had off and I was like, man, I didn't have healthcare. I didn't have any of these things. And we weren't mi really making that, that much money back then, Correct. you know, for it to, to sustain. And I was like, you know no one wants to rock with me. I'm just going to pick up, you know, other things that I can still be creative with. And one of those things that got me through was uh, web development. You know, like I built websites for everyone from, you know, the diary of Alicia Keys. I built that site, you know, um, to Annie Lennox, Luther Vandross, Aaliyah's site before she passed, like, you know, black round records. I had the deals with like, I had deals with like Motown and, and, and J records. And I was building all of that, all of that, which is how I, kind of became on the cool side with um with the club scene and you know because I I, I could accept that one hundred and fifty dollars that they were offering for me to DJ all night for, for six hours. Right. And because I still I was still able to pay my bills with what I was doing on the web development side. So 
I, I don't feel like it was anything. It wasn't There's luck. no mistakes. Bro. No, no, no. I just, I really, bro, when I tell you, like the other day, for instance, you know, just to fast forward where I am right now. Right. I played um, Beyonce's 41st birthday party. You know, they reached out, out to me and said, hey, B wants you to be, uh, wants, you, wants you to invite you as a guest. And I was like, what's up, brother? And I was like, all right, cool. And I was like, damn, it's, the, it's a disco party. Man, I should, man, I should be I, spinning. I should be playing a set. Two days later, it was like, um, he said, can you play all night? I'm like, all night? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's I'm like, nah, I can't play all night. I'll do a I'll set. Play, I'll do a set? Like, what's a set? What's a set? Like, an hour? One hour. One and hour. That's it. That's it. At 59, we wrapping the chords up? It was a six-hour <laughs> It was a six hour party. I was like, nah, I'll play one hour. They were like, oh, can you play? Because you want a party. People think that you don't want to have fun, too, because yeah. I seen you do your set and then kick it. Yeah. So what was beautiful about this was <laughs> when I started playing music at her party, right. the energy was so good that by the time I looked at the time, I had already played for five straight hours. You lying. And I was like, And you, know you ain't what? invite me? Man, you ain't shit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Beyonce, you supposed to invite me so I could, you know. All right, next one. It'll be one next year. Well, it will be one next year, man. But so, I ended up, I just played the whole six hours, and it reminded me how much of you, those days, mm -hmm. of how much I loved music in the beginning when it wasn't about, yo, I'm just going to play a set. Or it wasn't about the money. It, it was, was for like, the love. It was for the love of music. And that night reminded me of that. And I was like, man, I really do love what I do. Stay in your vibe and stay in your um in your lane. I feel like you found yourself, um, honestly, I feel like you found your true happiness and what you're doing with it. Because you obviously are a very bright guy. And you are very, very adaptive, you know, from the back in the uh, how to be a player days. You know, you adapt to the situation. Absolutely. So when this door closed, you went to another one and you went to another one and you went to another one. And what I want to give you your flowers about, as a producer, a person who, before you became all these other elements, as a producer, you already have an ear. And you have a uh, a uh, proclivity. That's Absolutely, good, you know, that's an educated word. Uh, a <laughs> proclivity for vibe. Yes, it's all about the vibe for me. Mm -hmm. It's not about any specific genre. And 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 I'm I'm not trying to just name drop. I'm just giving you a, a moments of when I recognized what it was, and it was like there was a moment when I went to a party. Um, I was playing in Vegas, mm -hmm. and it was my first time playing in Vegas. I was. I was getting a name for myself. This was probably like 04. And I was at Tao in Vegas. And I'm I got on. I was excited. I'm I'm a New York DJ. Right. Now I'm in Vegas. So I'm like, yo. <laughs> I'm, I started playing music and I started yelling. I, you know, every DJ got the DJ voice. Right. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> and exactly. And then one of the guys that owned the club, he came over to me. And the, I mean the room was packed. And he was like, D, you got to learn. He said it real calmly, too. You have to learn to speak with music. And I was upset. I'm like, yo, I mean, I can't talk I on can't the mic. I can't talk. The best advice that anyone has ever given me up until, you know, at that, right. that point, right. was to learn how to play music and have people remember that feeling without you yelling at them. Not to say that that's a bad thing. That right. works for some DJs. Right. Like, I want to hear Kid Capri on the mic. Oh, I got to. I can't you go know? to Kid Capri party. He not talking. That's... I, I need to hear Grandmaster Flash on the mic. Yes, sir. I want to hear DJ Clue on the mic. Matter of fact, you know, like, I want to hear them on the mic. But that's, the, that's, what, that's what they built. I, hear, I had a chance to do something where it was about, strictly about the music. I wanted people to love me just because of the music. Absolutely. And and I mean, and they love them for for the music as well. But they also love them because they they also create a vibe with they got that voice. I didn't have that at that point, you know. So I learned to play with music. And then the other the other moment, the other lesson that I learned was one day. This was probably like ten years ago, ten or fifteen years ago, maybe, right. maybe like ten years ago. Quest Love was DJing, oh, and I was I, I went to Quest. yeah I went to a party and he was playing and he was mixing Nirvana Nirvana's uh, Teen Spirit. With the drums from Bell Biv DeVoe's Poison. You lying. When the guitars was like, and it was like mixing, and I was like, oh my God. How did he hear He's that? playing because he he was listening from a drummer's perspective. Me as a music producer and not as just a straight musician like he is, I find I find the rhythm differently. He found it, he finds it when he's mixing, because I don't know anybody that can blend James Brown records, because those are like Live drums, Quest Love can. <laughs> can, and it was like I, I, I was like, yo, shit, 
I got to get, I got to learn to play from that perspective as well. So like as a DJ, I can play for anyone. I can play trap all night. I can play dance music, EDM, South African house is like my jam right now. Like, right, right, right. you know, like, you know, my favorite DJ is, is black coffee, you know, like I can play all of that music, but then I can go and play a whole night of yacht music. And you'll feel like you're back in the 70s oh, because that's what I grew God. up loving. And it's like understanding those rhythms and like. So you know what it is you just reminded me of? You remind me of Prince. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Prince was a natural musician. So he could jump on another instrument. Yeah. So he would just jump on the drums. Then he would jump on the on the bass. Then he would jump on the sax. Then he would jump on the, uh, um, he would jump on the, um, on the little uh, tambourine. Like anything, I, I I went to a Prince concert and I was just blown away, and it made me realize like what an attribute that is. So mm -hmm. like what you what you saw in Quest Love was it was like a superpower. Sure. Like as a as a as, as a consummate drummer, he hears his music from this particular rhythm. That's a that's a superpower. Yes. And now you added that element. So now when you're mixing, you're going to hear it. In almost like three days, am I getting it? No, you you got you nailed it. You know, yeah. like I really do hear it that way. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, even you know, like I don't play. I don't even have a set list. You know, I got old playlists from like someone will ask me to do something, and you know, folders with like a bunch of music. But mm -hmm. I don't have a set. It. I literally, I, the only thing that I ever do as a DJ is think about the very first song that I'm gonna play because that's uh, that that, that will gets decide you going. on the tone. You know that I'm gonna set. It's always the first song, and from there, I just go from here. And um, as a, as a, as a person, real, this is just popped in my head. Mm -hmm. What is a quintessential song that gets the party? And I'm gonna tell you one of my favorite songs that I think is a building song that can get the party going. And you tell me what your first one. Let me see. Um, it depends on the party. Uh, all right, okay. I'm gonna give you a vibe. It's uh, New York. It is rooftop summertime sexy. New York. Rooftop, summertime, sexy. Is it R and B or hip hop? Two different things. I'm gonna go R and B. If I'm going R and B, New York, little old school vibe, sexy. All right. Yeah, that's. The, I mean, yeah, you got. I got to even be more specific because okay. it depends on. All right, one song that will always get ladies on the dance floor if you're in your '90s bag is gonna be your '90s, 2000s bag will be like Lil Mo and Fab, um, <sighs> forever. If you're in that vibe, there's something about that record. If you are in the R&B, if you're it's, in the... It's, like, it's, it's, it's a vibe. As soon as that beat comes on... <laughs> Everybody's... It's like, yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like... Oh, my God. If you're going, to your, if you're going into your 80s bag, uh -huh. R, we're still R&B, Alexander O'Neill and oh, Sherelle, oh Saturday Love, God. is always going to get Monday, women... Monday, Saturday Love. And because... The reason why I tap into songs like that is because we, and why it resonates, is because we live through experiences. So, like, when I DJ, every song that I play reminds me of a moment that I may have first heard that song. Wow. I, I literally visualize, well, anytime I play that record, it, and this may sound weird to anybody, like, but when I play Saturday Love, I think about 13-year-old D-Nice, and the first time I heard that record, I was in Central Park, I was in the Walkathon. And I was walking in the park by myself because I was always a loner. And it was like these girls walking together and they had a little boom box and, <laughs> and they were playing that record, you know, you know, yeah. and obviously, obviously it was like age appropriate. She was probably like 13. I was 13. But I, I remember that was like the first time that I like recognized like, oh, I got it. Oh, she's hot. She's a cutie. And, and, she, she, got, and she got a fly radio and she got the right music on. So like as an adult, when I play <laughs> that, I'm like, man, I wonder, I always think I'm like, man, I wonder who she became. Maybe she's that person or whatever, you know? Right. So, and every record reminds me of something, you know, like if I'm playing hip hop, now I got a different, I used to think like if I play like MOP or if I play like Mob Deep's um, Shook Ones, right. I used to think about Funkmaster Flex being in like Club Envy in New York. Every time I played it, I remember what that vibe was like. But like that vibe has been that memory was replaced when when I was like when Barack was in the office and it was like the second to the last party when before he left the White House right 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 and I was playing like mad um R and B and like oh, that was like, such a that was something to witness boy bro and Naomi Campbell was like Naomi Campbell and my friend ja, um, Jaha they came over to me like yo you playing too much R and B be yourself and I was trying to be like um 
Wait, can you curse on this joint? Yeah, you can say oh. what you want. I was, I was trying to be an asshole. I was right. like, too much r and I'm gonna play the hardest record I got now to see what you mean. You know. right. And I put on MOP's Annie Up in the White House. And, no, you did not. And the floor was like vibrating. People went crazy, and I was like, oh God. Then the I, rap now? Yep. MOP now. Every yo, whenever I'm in the gym and I'm <laughs> I, and I catch that lull and I'm getting a little whatever, and I throw on MOP or shook ones, oh. I can give you another 50, 60 push-ups, Work. 24 more reps. I those songs, that energy of is different. It's different. I haven't heard an anthem like that in a minute. When that chicken ones came on in the White House, boom. I was like, oh my gosh, where am um, I right now? Um. Like, and then that's when I just zoned out. <laughs> um, um. No, no, no. That's that's survival of the fittest. Wait, wait, wait which shook ones? Um oh, wait a minute, shook oh ones. Oh my god. Wait a minute, shook ones, shook ones. Shook. <laughs> to all my killers in my hundred dollar billers. <laughs> It was like, oh, it was nuts in there. We bro. got no feelings. <laughs> yes, one of the I played songs, the clean versions though. I played yeah, the clean you, versions because you had to ask. One of my yeah, one yeah. of my songs that I like is, <laughs> is, is 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 like it's a sexy way to get there. I'm not a DJ, but I host a lot of parties. Is a uh, uh, Shaka Khan. Which one? Because <laughs> oh, I know you. I live you. Boom. I know where I live you, yeah. It, it just, it's because, like, I, I came up in, I'm from Jersey, for all the people who don't know, shout out to the Brick City in the building. Um, we, we we had a lot of house music influence. Yes. Um, a lot, shout out to Chicago, too, uh, the home of house music. But we had in New York, Timmy Regisford, we had yep. um, Tony Humphreys, and they used to mix these old school, you know, songs, and it was a vibe. And so, like, when I hear Shaka Khan or uh, All I Do, uh, oh yeah, those records are. Yeah, yeah, like those. The, the, but they weren't meant to be house records, mm -hmm. but they kind of fit in house music. They do, and Stevie's another star. Like songs like that, those songs definitely. So I used to go to Jersey, the Club Sensation. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? And Zanzibar. Going, like, Zanzibar. Like, I used to go because I couldn't get into in New York. They wouldn't let me in Bentley's, and plus Bentley's was a different vibe. It was a little older. It was that. Yeah, it was like this older vibe, and was like Colonel Abrams vibe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not gonna let. Big I'm shoulder. not going to let you had to have shoulder vibe. You had to have shoulder pads and shoulder pads vibe. <laughs> but Jersey has with dancing. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you guys we, were dancing, so we I would dances. go over there, like hang out and um and listen to music. That's what I'm saying. Like this journey of mine doesn't start in the quarantine. Like it it really Literally. started back then. Yeah, um, you already was on. I think um your trajectory was already in process. Yes. You were already on your path. You found an opportunity when I felt like everyone could appreciate it. Like we weren't all busy and running around. And I also, you know, heard a lot of people jealous of you at that time. I heard a lot of, you know, different DJs, I won't say no names, were saying like, yo, you know, he got lucky. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, cause I'm blah, 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 and I'm bigger than him and he getting more money than me. Like there were people that were very jealous of the opportunity as well. We gotta be honest. No, for sure. And um, I don't knock it though, man. Like, no, it's like, listen, you, you, everybody's path is different, yes. right? Like, like DJ Cassidy, I find to be a very creative um, entertainer as well with his music. Like I follow him and he's a good friend of mine and I support what he's doing. I like where DJs now have become, you know, personalities and it's not just a guy with carrying crates back in the day. Now you guys are, we're coming for you. Like sure. your brand now, I'm, when your brand shows up, CQ, I'm going to that. Yes. Like I'm familiar, like your style, your energy. So it's basically like, you know, you're an artist again. In my opinion, I am, and and I think I've always, I've always been an artist, and I think the world has finally recognized the 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 talent and the power of DJs. Yes. So, in in, in partially, we owe it to um, dance music EDM DJs mm -hmm. for like showing like big venues that yes, people will come to hear a DJ play. Absolutely, because they they know they're going to have a good time. Like, yes. You remind me the first time I saw Steve Aoki, I ran into him on a plane. We was flying to Vegas, right? And uh, he was like, yo, B, man, won't you come check my show? I said, yo, I've been hearing about you, the you know, number one DJ in Vegas. Like, he was like, my, he said, my shows are so crazy. You won't believe until you see it. So I'm like, oh, man, all right, he hyping this stuff up. I'm going to go. So I had a show, and then I come to his show probably like 1 in the morning. It is packed out. It's at the Cosmopolitan. I don't know how. It's indoor, outdoor. As far as you can see is people, right? 
And if, and everybody's going like this. All of a sudden, they come out with all these birthday cakes. Yes. And he jumps up on top of the thing and start busting people in the head with birthday cakes. I was like, man, don't get no cake on this jacket. Don't get no cake. <laughs> but it went bananas. And I realized at that moment that it is the show. It is the show. It's more than the music it's now. It's more than the music. It's the show. It's the show, bro. So... It, the difference with his audience and and my audience mm -hmm. is people that are listening to more open format music, they're going to the party, they want to feel sexy. Mm -hmm. You're going to put on your whatever it is, your right. fly sneakers. You're not throwing birthday cake on them. No, no. <laughs> You're not. You know what I'm saying? Like no, that's, it's going to be a problem. I want to, but, but we I not, want to throw something at them. But we're not doing it. But that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Steve's audience, they really do come to party. Yeah, they come and they're young. They're young, they and come they, to party. And, and they don't care about cake. They eat the cake off their fingers. They don't care. They don't care about the cake. Because it's an experience for them. Absolutely. You know, and I think, like, now people are finding ways, DJs are finding ways to provide an experience for people, you know, not just um, not just to get in there and play records. Mm -hmm. You know, like, a lot of the EDM DJs, they go in and they create these different edits. So when you hear them play... It's a different experience. The song is way different than what you heard on the radio. Absolutely. I, I love that about it, and, and I appreciate it. So my my I don't have that kind of time, to be honest with you, because I'm constantly working every day. So my way of providing a different experience is to actually use musicians on top of it when I play. Like nice. when I played, I sold out Carnegie Hall. You know, like they don't have DJs playing at Carnegie Hall like that. Bro. You know what I mean? Like, But I used I used a 30-piece orchestra while I was DJing. What? I had Jadakiss come out. While I was playing, we gonna make it with full uh, string section uh, on top of it. Playing. What with yeah, the yeah, violins? No. We Every, gonna make full, it. Not just the violin. Full no, string what section. I'm saying, I'm hearing yes. the strings. Yes. Mm. Mm. Uh, oh. So <laughs> you know, so it's like that's what I want people. I, love what I want you're people doing. to to know, like that it's you're coming not because you you just want to dance. You're coming for an experience. Absolutely. And and that works for me now. So you know? tell me tell me this. Now that you have found your groove and you are working relentlessly like I will reach out to you and I won't hear from you. I get back 10 yeah, days yeah. cuz you know you're in Australia, you go different places and whatever. Yeah. What what is it like now when you when you when you perform now? Is it uh is it is is it it's like a euphoric feeling knowing that people really are coming in and they really appreciate you now more than you. Yes, because when you are more of an open format DJ like myself, you mm -hmm. and you see how many people are coming out to festivals to see like, you know, uh, see a Calvin Harris or to yeah. see and you know, and and this is not even just based on the financials. You know, like the financials have always been different with you know an EDM DJ versus more open format or even a hip hop straight up hip hop DJ. For me to um, be in this position to be one of the few people that can just play anything and people are coming out to hear, like, yo, it's very emotional for me. Like, I don't want people to think that I take this for granted. You right. know, like like the other day when I played Vegas, I had my weekend in Vegas, CQ Live weekend, and we had we had all of the, all, you know, just tons of artists and people. And I remember one of the sets that I was playing was that Sunday morning. So every night was a different theme. Friday night was the welcome party. I had like nice and smooth. And it was all I played was 90s hip hop. You know, the next day we did like me. I, I Since it was my weekend, I opened up for the, the other DJs because I didn't want them to have to figure out who's going to go on first. I was like, no, I'm going to go on first. So you guys can like, you don't have to Relax. be there when people are right. like walking in because I know what that feeling is like. The Sunday morning was one that was just so dope to me because it was. Um, I remember standing on that stage and it was. It was. Uh, where were you? Where, 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 where we were in you? Vegas. We were at. Um, the show was at uh, Virgin Theater. The Virgin Theater. Yep, yeah. at the Virgin Hotel. And I remember standing on that stage. Now this wasn't a regular party. This was like during the quarantine. I started doing praise and worship on Sundays. Where I one day I was like, I just got up and started playing gospel music, and next right. thing you know, it was like eighty thousand people in there. I was like, wait. <laughs> They want to hear me play people, gospel. People too. love God, bro. Please. Listen, ain't so nothing that, wrong with it. Ain't nothing wrong with it. No, it's great. So that Sunday in Vegas, when I stood there and before I played the first record, I just looked at the crowd and I was like, yo, I don't know how this is going to go because I'm used to doing it online. Right. I'm like, you know, when I'm playing Never Gonna Make It, are they going to sit down and watch me? You know what I mean? Never would have made it. Man, when I started playing <laughs> gospel music, oh, 
Yo, they went crazy. crazy. When I slowed it down to like never would have made it, all I saw was hands oh, and people oh, oh, yes. were in a zone. I love it. I love it, bro. And then Fred Hammond came out and Israel Halton came out. Like I was bringing gospel the same way I do, you know, a Jadakiss. I was bringing gospel artists, Karima Trotter, like people. It was such an experience. And, and, and to me, I, I would rather be this type of artist than anything where Yo, I can, I have the Because there's no ceilings. There's, there are no ceilings. I have, there are no, I'm not confined by anything no. other than good music and an experience. Bro, bro, <laughs> tell me this. Tell me this. Now, now that we're here, we have, uh, we've turned um, lemons into lemonade, so to speak. We all went through this, you know, this COVID and thing and people are coming back out. Um, what is one of the flyest places you went to recently? Um, in terms of traveling, just travel. Like you went there, and the vibe was incredible. Man, when did I play recently? Um, yeah, Cabo was crazy. Oh, um, man, uh, Madrid. You went to okay, yeah, Madrid that's how, was. That's how we doing it. Madrid. See, ben, did you hear that? Yeah, Madrid. Yeah, yeah, Madrid yeah. was insane. Yeah, he was in. He was in Compton. He didn't go to. No, he no, just, no. He went. To, he he was he spun in <laughs> Compton. It was a good party though, was it not, Ben? Yeah, but it was not Madrid. Yeah, so it so wasn't Madrid. the language language didn't didn't stop nothing. No, no, Madrid was crazy. Um, uh, yeah, no, I get to travel. That's another thing. I get to travel the world, and it was because I was experimenting with music during the quarantine. So mm -hmm. people all over the world got a chance to hear me. You know, like my second largest audience after the United States is actually India, and then after India is Canada, then it's Brazil, and the the number five place is um is um uh gosh it's uh nigeria because i was playing a lot of like afro beat and just african music during the quarantine and they they discovered it they locked in you know so when i i meet like south african djs or you know djs from anywhere in africa they're like yo like i went to burning man mm -hmm. to play a set i've always wanted to oh, go burning to burning man crazy man. i don't, I don't oh, think are you out in the dirt or like are you just like out there and there's no power something crazy white nah, people I mean, there's have, a lot of white people they have, just, they have generators they got generators I mean? to brush your teeth and yeah, yeah. do, and do but, it but it's but it's a i heard it's like a crazy like uh experience it's though. the craziest and i only went for one day because i went i played i was in vegas to for for like rehearsals on a Wednesday, then I flew to Burning Man on Thursday, and then my Vegas weekend started on Friday. Mm -hmm. So I went 24 hours Burning Man, and I could not believe the experience that I had of just music, of like global vibrations. <sighs> and like, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't think I'll ever Killing work another right Labor now. Day weekend. N listen, listen, do you, do you, like you just said, some the global vibrations. Global so vibe, that's that's what yeah. we're talking about. Global vibration is the music, the it's language the music. that we relate to, whether we know the song or not. When we close our eyes, like you guys, some of you guys are watching this podcast. Some of you guys will listen to it. You will listen to his party music and it will take you somewhere. And um, I, I think that's a beautiful thing that you are able to do. And like you said, you found your true artistry and you still have your photography and you still are performing relentlessly. Well, you got you got anything coming up that you could tell us about that I need to, you know, prep my people for? Man, big shows coming up. Um, you Any know, cities that we could tap in? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I actually, I'll, I'll say it to you, you know, I'm really working on something right now at, at the, um, the, I want the Kennedy Center. Mm. You know, I want the Kennedy Center um, we're probably like 90% there locking it in for, for this to happen sometime in November. Anything and I'm big saying sometime. For, because, it's anything big for New Year's Eve that I could kind of plan my way around? Like, you know, are we going to be in Madrid? Are we going to be in, you know, where are we going to be, bro? We, no, no. I'm uh, You know, more than likely I'll be doing television for New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know see, what I'm saying? You know, bad. I got my options. You know what I mean? You see, be, be, you see what he said? I'm going to be on TV, bro. Uh, you, know, you know, I'll probably be I'm not going to be on IG, IG. I'm going to be on No, TV. no, and then I'm going to get on IG after. After. So that's the beauty. Okay. I I haven't abandoned the, the, the virtual core. club quarantine. Yes. You know, like, I'll go and play a big event and get a big check and, and we'll argue with them like, man, I'm not playing two and a half hours. Right. You get 90 minutes from me. But then after that, I'll go home and play on IG for like seven hours for free. <laughs> They're like, we thought you didn't play that. Hey, well. listen, I were, <laughs> when we were in New York City, this was last year, and uh, you was like, yo, B, let's just go to the game real quick. I'm going to do, I got a quick set, and I'm done. I'm like, man, you going to do a quick set. You had that joint. Wop, wop, bop, bop, bang. 15 minutes set. And we out. Halftime, 15 Boom. minutes. And we out. 75th anniversary of, of, of the Knicks. And let's go. Done. Let's go. I never we seen the check so fast. 
I like, if I do 15 minutes, the minimum amount of comedy I do is 20 minutes. Like, I just did the Toyota Center in Houston. That was 20 minutes. And it went fast. I don't know about you. 20 minutes as a comedian feels like two minutes. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, I, mean, I personally, I like, I think two hours for me as a DJ is a good amount of time, you right. know, to, because I like to build. I don't, I don't want to just jump in. You know, like some DJs will ask me, like, if I have an opener, they're like, Hey, um, are there any songs that I should stay away from? Mm. I'm like, songs stay away. You know, they've been making music for, you know, hundred years. Right, you know right, what right, I mean? Right, like, right. you can play whatever it is that you want. You know, like I, I have my own thing. You know, my vibe isn't just based on what's current. It's based on what feels good. So play what you want. And uh, I feel like in two hours, I can take, I can take an audience on a journey. Bro, you didn't need much. You don't need that much time to do it. You, you, you're, you're good at what you do. I mean, you was at the Oscars, bro. Playing. I seen that. Yes. I said, you know, for DJs, for artists, for what it is and how hard it has been to, you know, sort of cool up the Oscars, you know, for years, it's just been this very, very prestigious and very sort of uh, tight buttoned <laughs> event in Hollywood. Yes. And you were a part, you, Will Packer, uh, are part of making it cool and giving it some swag i thought that was a beautiful situation yes you know when i when i received the call to um play the oscars initially i was only invited to play the um the governor's ball right and i was like all right cool i was amped like oh be nice at the governor's ball i'm not mad at that no <laughs> then i got a call to play um to play event for the vanity fair party and i was like oh this is really a thing yeah. all right cool then i got the call to play Gal series party that he does every year with like madonna and you know I was like, oh, I'm lit right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my night is crazy. Bro, you never <laughs> stop moving. No. Then Will Packer called. He right. sent me a text. He was like, yo, FaceTime me right now. And I FaceTime him. And he's like, yo, be nice. Plan the Oscars. I was like, you mean the governor's ball? He said, no. No, the Oscars. I'm producing the Oscars. And I need you to play on the Oscars. And I was like, yo, this is crazy. That's crazy. So for me, it's um I, love I it, hope man. that I'm it's so happy for I, you. I just hope, look, man, I'm 52. You right. know what I mean? Like, there's not much that we, you know, I know I'm older than you, but that we haven't seen already right. in terms of like our careers. And we've seen the highs and lows, and I made money and then lost everything and was black sleeping on the floor. Like, I'm not, I don't need much. But if I can use this as a way to inspire another generation of just DJs, and in particular, I'll keep it real with you, like young black hip hop DJs, to see past just hip hop, right? See, see the global vibe. Let's to keep see that the global. The global vibration. The global vibration that is man. connecting with everybody. Yes, I like that. That's why. That's why Drake can make this last album that he made. That's why Beyonce can say they, they, Yo, have, they, they have no ceilings on their talent no because ceilings. they can appeal to the global vibration. I'm going to steal that because that is what we really want. Like, I, I want my jokes to transcend globally. Like, if I say something that's funny, I want everyone to feel the laughter and get the sense of where I'm going with it, right? And But music is bigger, much bigger than comedy because you don't always have to know context. Sometimes with music, you can just close your eyes and you're there. True. That's it. The that's, frequency. That's really, it, it is the frequency. It is, is it, it is that vibration, bro. Like, mm. because that happens to me even, you know, like when I play at home, um, I, I have a hard time watching other DJs play um, virtually. Not that I don't enjoy the sets, but it's like when I'm listening to it from a phone, because I set myself up to have like speakers and like a real situation at home, it becomes, it becomes difficult for me, <clears throat> excuse me, to sit back and just listen to it without having the experience that I'm used to. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The way that I give it to people. So it's like, I know when I'm home, I can turn that light off and 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 play a club quarantine after dark set, and I'm in it just as much as other people are into oh. it because I'm listening to it, and I'm that vibration is so high for me where, you know, I don't know Man, many. You, you might be the damn near. You damn near Miles Davis. You the Miles Davis of DJs right now. Like it's a vibe, baby. It's a vibe, baby. You know, I gotta get that voice down. You I gotta get that. Miles, ah, it's I a vibe. That Miles, that Miles I, voice. I, um, it's a vibe, baby. It's a vibe, baby. I'm be nice, baby. On our show before <laughs> before we you know we close up, we have, we have a section on our show called All Facts. And as I was uh, listening to you, you know, light up about you know your your career and things you love to do. 
I'm going to give you a good all facts. All facts means I ask you a question, you got to tell the truth. Yep. All right? All facts. You said open, you called it open format DJ, correct? Correct. If you could put together top five open format DJs right now to throw the most unbelievable party in Vegas, who would they be? Um, top five open format DJs. Yeah. Stretch Armstrong, Rich Medina. Boom. Tony Touch, boom. DJ Clark Kent, boom, and DJ Jazzy Jeff. So, 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 I, I ain't got nothing for that. Yeah, that would I, be my top five. I, I'm not because I've I seen what they fuck, can do I can't in even any fuck order. With that. I was gonna say against my DJs, but but I got I got DJs. Who you got? Okay, you got? but I, I can't go by open format. I just gotta go by the DJs that I've seen in my life. That is bananas. All right, well, you said open format, so. I, but, but I don't know it like that. Okay, okay. Can, can I just do my you shit? Gotta, gotta do okay, shit. cool. I got Kid Capri. Of course. Okay, boom. I got, um, mm-hmm. Okay, I got, I'm going to go Stevie J. Miami. Miami. I'm going to go uh, DV, DJ Envy. I'm going to go, I got two more, right? Two more, two more, two more, two more. Uh, I got to go New York, got to go New York, got to go New York. Um, I'm going to go Flex. I'll go flex. I got one more, one more. And now I want to do, I'm going to do one that's so different. And people, people going to be like, what? Erica Badu. Oh, come on. Erica Badu. Down, I'm just going to go. down Loretta Brown. Yo. <laughs> come on now. No. Yo, Erica. People, people don't Erica. know Erica Badu is a DJ too. Yeah, like That's low down, low down Loretta Brown. Come on. Like, like I, I just, she popped in my head because I was at a party and she was DJing and she was actually nice as fuck. She's nice. Yeah. And she plays instruments while she's rocking. She'll have a tambourine. Come going. on. She's like an incense. Like she's like, she's setting a vibe for real. I, I mean, I think for me it's unfair. Like, cause I, the DJs I picked are like my DJs and my crew. Yeah, yeah I, know, like, I know. You know, I'm but, I mean, you people. just picked but the superhero. Your those super are, friends. Those are, those are my. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like, I'm. You know, it's like mafia, family first. Yeah, it's family, family first. first. Yeah, but, family over everything. But if it's like, if I'm just gonna pick some other DJs too, like they're, you know, like Black Coffee is amazing. Yeah. You know, like watching the Calvin Harris. It, he's Calvin he's, Harris is a beast. He's amazing. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Like you, you watching a Tiesto like rock a room. Like a big room is different. It's different. You know, like, so, and the thing that I love that I'm kind of conditioning to, like conditioning my audience to, is to allow a song play. So a lot of DJs that you mentioned may not play an entire song. No, they don't. My, no. My, 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 we, giving you thir- we giving you 28 seconds and we yeah, jumping. Yeah, you're jumping. That's a different type of DJ. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like quick sex. Oh, it's like, <laughs> me, I'm like, you letting them, you let us make love I, to the music. I, I'm, I'm letting it breathe. Let I'm letting it breathe. breathe. Cause that's, that's the, the DJs that I went and studied when hip hop DJs wouldn't let me open for them. Okay. I went and I listened to house music DJs. I went and listened to Lil, little Louis Vega and you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, and, and I noticed that they were playing these records where it wasn't just, it wasn't about scratching at all. Actually, it was about creating a vibe. Yeah. I think that's your word, vibe, man. Vibe is global, my word, man. Vibe and global vibration. Global vibration. So, you, man, if you really smoked weed, you could just be, it, it, like, if you lifted this you hat some, up. You got some? Right, right. If you, you just lifted this hat up, the <laughs> global vibration would come out of here. Yeah, that's that's. Well, it. I want to thank you so much for making the time to come to Top Billing and give us the love and give us the, the inside of what CQ is. And for those who are listening, that is Club Quarantine. It does not stop because the quarantine is over. He's moving. He's shaking. Tell everybody how they can follow you, man, and stay, stay, stay tapped. I in. mean, I'm all I'm D nice on IG and, yes. and uh, D nice on Twitter and yes. D nice on Facebook. Everything, everything you know, D nice, everything D nice, man. You know, and and um, you know, I'm I'm really about the people and the audience, and and you know, once I got my chance to do something that was um that that gave people love, I just want to continue pouring love into them. You know, so CQ Club Quarantine is here. You know, I, I just enjoy it. These shows are selling out and, and um, you know, people are coming out and, and dancing and leaving with a great experience. And, and that's that's what I'm about. Bro. And you're all about the vibe. And make sure we stay on tap for that Kennedy Center situation. I'm going to be on, I'm going to be following you. I want to make sure I'm going to speak it into fruition. Yes. Positive manifestation. That's it. That concludes this episode of Top Billing. Your man, Bill Bellamy, appreciate all the fans that's making us number one. We love you. We'll see you next week on Top Billing, baby. It's the podcast for the movement, the culture, and the discussion. Peace. Ah!
Double D, how crazy is that? You don't even have time. You don't even have time to do photography. He don't have photography. He's, you still got a picture of me almost so bad. I'm gonna tell you what I know. I'm gonna tell you what it was. We was at the Dream Hotel, and there was a flag on the wall behind me. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they told me to say, be just, he said, Chan. Yo! I was like, I know it felt right. Do you remember that year? Because I could, I could sort through the images. 